From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. For the past seven years, the Rhode Island School of Design has been led by Roseanne Summerson. She's retiring as president at the end of the month, so my colleague Ted Nisi went to RISD to talk with her about the future of the school, the high cost of a college degree, and what lies ahead for one of Rhode Island's premier institutions of higher ed. Here now is Ted's conversation with Roseanne Summerson. President Summerson, thanks for taking the time to sit down with me today. It's a pleasure. Nice to see you. So I want to start, lots to talk about as you finish your tour of duty at RISD, but I want to start with the pandemic. And I was talking to a friend who teaches at RISD and reminded me when I said I was going to sit down with you that RISD has a lot of tactile lessons that you need to teach. You need to teach woodworking, you need to teach glassworks, things that I imagine aren't easy to convert to Zoom. Mm -hmm. How uniquely challenging was the pandemic for RISD? Well, it was extraordinarily challenging, but we, I think, rose to the challenge very, very well. We actually had in-person hybrid classes, so we, and also remote classes. We had every kind of class. Our faculty pivoted over 760 classes to some sort of technology platform. But in person, we revamped the entire campus so that we created social distancing and new protocols so that our students and faculty and staff could be safe in the hands-on spaces. And since last March, we've had a cumulative number of 100 cases, and that's faculty, staff, and students, which is kind of a national um, uh, high tier in terms of, or low tier. <laughs> and so we're very proud of that. But I would say that um, COVID tested the internal workings of every institution, and it really helped us to understand that RISD was really solidly on ground and that the commitment by everyone, including the students who were heroes, really, was to keep us going and to keep everyone learning. And so it took the entire community to make it work, but it was evidence that the community is really strong and that the structures that we had were in place were good and that we could cope with a crisis like this. And when you look to the fall, um, you won't be the president anymore, but I'm sure you've been very involved in the planning yes. for it. How, how much back to normal do you hope or expect classes to be in the fall at RISD? We're hoping for full normal. I mean, it depends a little on the vaccine rate. We have a target, and if we get there, everything will be full normal. Mm -hmm. We're really looking forward to that, and uh, I'm happy to have set the stage for that. And I'm sure the students are looking forward to very that much too, so. very much. Yeah. So let's talk about your tenure at RISD. You've been president of RISD for six years. You've been involved with RISD, not to age you, nearly a half a century because you came here as a student in the 1970s. Yes. Um, as president, what's your proudest accomplishment? Okay, well, actually, I've been president seven and a half years because I did a, um, an interim. Journalists don't get any uh, math okay. training, as That's you can okay. tell. I did my math wrong this morning. I apologize. You know, it's so hard to say one thing because RISD's changed so much in seven and a half years. And I guess the, the proudest thing is our current strategic plan because it really amplifies our values and what we want to achieve in the future. It's, very, it's looking toward our 150th anniversary. And it has some main, the three main pillars are about just societies and our commitment to advancing pedagogy and enrollment and uh, every um, part of RISD around social justice and equity issues. The second um, pillar is around sustainability and that has multiple meanings. Sustainability of just an institution but also how we live in the world and how we affect climate and other um, kinds of challenges that the next generations face. And what's really interesting is that the overlap between those two pillars, just societies and climate and sustainability, is something that's a really deep learning space that we're working very hard in. And then the third pillar is about the development of new knowledge, which is the purpose of higher ed. But in our disciplines, things are changing so much, and the crossovers and are what's creating innovation in so many fields. So those three pillars are really a great roadmap for RISD's future. And the flip side of the coin, what's your biggest regret or unfinished business or something you look back on and think, maybe if I had a do-over? I don't look back, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Smart, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other big aspect, when I, at my inauguration, I talked about access to a RISD education. 
and I'm really proud of the, the progress we've made there. We have increased, um, since 2014, the diversity of our student body by 49%. This incoming class is 47% diverse, and that's happened through incredible fundraising support uh, structures. We've created a new orientation program that students are paid to attend for first-generation college goers. We've put so much effort into ensuring that the best and brightest students have access to a RISD education and that when they get here they have a full RISD experience and they can succeed. You allude though there to the cost of an education. Yeah. This is hardly just a RISD thing but I had to look it up today. Of course. $77,000 yeah. a year on campus. Yeah. That's over $300,000 for a four-year degree. Yeah. There, I know there's a lot of financial aid but RISD does have students who are pursuing the fine arts which I would imagine at least initially unless you become a famous painter for example might not be lucrative. Yeah. How much do you worry about having to charge that level of price to yeah. students who maybe at least initially are going to pursue something that's a passion that won't be as remunerative. Sure, so there's a lot of uh, parts of that question that are important. One is that we've used that as a guiding principle throughout my presidency for planning. So we've really cut back our resource expenditures in very creative and, and intentional ways. We've increased financial aid by 46%. So we're, we're actually able now to offer every single student who has need a package, not necessarily meeting full need, although we're working toward that, but uh, at least a package. And so we're actually recruiting those students, but also admitting those students, which is fantastic. The, the tuition increase next year, even after all the challenges of COVID finances, will be the lowest increase since 1975. And that's something, again, that we've very intentionally geared ourselves toward. And part of what we've done is I've um, put a huge commitment into building a real fundraising operation at RISD, the way, something at the level it's never had. Interesting. So that was, I think of that is so core to most higher ed institutions. It there is. wasn't as much of it at RISD before. Well, we had a fundraising division, but it didn't have the resources to achieve what it needed. And we've just had three record fundraising years and, and laid the groundwork for even more fundraising years in the future. Our endowment is at its highest point ever. Our uh, fundraising around scholarships and financial aid has um, just topped the charts for RISD. You know, in, in our cumulative history, we've never raised as much money as we had recently. So, so that's all been a commitment of ours because we deeply understand this conundrum. It's a very expensive delivery model of education. But I'll just counter your point a little bit about the fine arts um, because our students are doing incredibly well. We did a, um, a survey, uh, the first alumni survey in 12 years, a couple of years ago, and our students were in the very top percent of entrepreneurship successes, um, higher than MIT and um, Harvard and other really institutions that have a lot of entrepreneurial success. But because of the kind of creative education our students are receiving at RISD, they're able to go into all kinds of fields and use the creativity, which is such a key part of defining what work is about in the future. They're able to use their RISD education in many unexpected ways, as well as in achieving success as artists and designers. Well, and uh, that actually goes to a, a question I wanted to ask you, because so we're, you're going to be talking to a general audience in this interview, uh, uh, reaching Rhode Islanders who maybe they know a little bit about RISD, but maybe they never don't have anyone in their life who went there or don't know too much about it. What do you think is the biggest misconception in Rhode Island among the general public about RISD? Well, I think there's a misconception in general and certainly in Rhode Island about the notion of the kind of starving artist and the addict making, you know, anguishing over work. And of course, there are students, maybe not in addicts, but that, you know, that's always a part of any creative practice, but our students are coming to RISD to learn how to use their talents to make impact in the world and to make the world a better place. And it's remarkable over the long time that I've been here to see that artists and designers are less interested about stardom. They want to succeed, and their parents certainly want them to succeed, but they're interested in finding ways to improve lives for other people, to use their talents and their creative thinking and their problem-solving abilities to actually tackle some of the big problems that are facing communities. And they're succeeding in those arenas. So I think expanding the notion of what the results of an art and design education can achieve are some of the ways to break down the preconceptions that people have about what art school might have been like 30 or 40 years ago. Well, that's a good segue, because I wanted to ask 
you, you've been at RISD for a long time, which means you have a perspective on how the institution has changed. What do you think of as the biggest change at RISD since you arrived here in the 70s? I think that fact of having a commitment to social engagement, to community engagement, to thinking about how to use talents, and develop them here, develop a voice and a language and a perspective that can then be applied to many other kinds of transferable skills and, and situations. The students, though, are far more activist in a wonderful way. And you know, if I were, if I went back to the regret, regrets question, I would say that. I, I'm sorry that some of the things that I wanted to put into place when I first became president didn't happen fast enough and the students urged us to move faster and to move bigger and to move more broadly which was fantastic. Um, but you know institutions are like moving a barge up a canal you know it's hard to move them quickly and make sure that everything is financed and all the operational pieces will succeed and success is very important when you're making change. But um, our students are increasingly activist and increasingly looking at redefining all the fields that they're coming here to study in ways that will promote a future that is far more diverse, far more innovative, far more complex, and that they'll be, ha they'll be able to handle those challenges. I'm curious about the footprint of RISD, because when I look around here, as we're here on, at the bottom of College Hill, there's not a lot of space around here. Uh, Brown, uh, Chris Paxson talks about that at Brown, too. Uh, do you see RISD needing significantly more space? Do you imagine ever having to, you know, they've had to go into the jewelry district for a lot of the medical things, or do you, do you have the space here that you think you'll need in the medium term for RISD's growth? Yeah, well, we have over 1.9 million square feet. And um, so... Yeah, you do have some big buildings. That's we do. And it, I think it's really about um, how we use them. One of our uh, departments is interior architecture, and their focus is on adaptive reuse. And as we're taking our... We're, we have a commitment to sustainability on the campus, and we've made big strides. But as we're renovating spaces, we're thinking about how to use them more flexibly, flexibly, more efficiently and effectively. So for now, I think RISD's footprint is pretty solid. I mean, we've, we've t we did build a new uh, residence, which we needed terribly. But within the existing buildings, I think small tweaks and changes can really achieve what we need to achieve here. There's huge demand to go to RISD. I think, you, I think you've mentioned that you're down to about 16% of applicants get in because so many people are applying. Could you ever see any significant expan expansion in the size of the student body at RISD or do you think it needs to stay this size to deliver the education you like? I think it's about 2,500 students. That's right. Well that's a topic under discussion and I don't know what the next president will decide but the intimacy of the school is really has really worked for us up till now. Um, I do think that, again, we've learned a lot in COVID about different ways that we can reach different populations that might not be able to have access to a RISD education, and those are important conversations for the future, but we don't have any uh, expansion plans at this particular point in time. We just want to expand scholarships and financial aid for the students who, who get into RISD so that they can actually come. One last question. Um, I, I, I tend to think there are a lot of Rhode Islanders who don't realize what is on offer to look at at the RISD Museum. They might think it's just some student exhibitions. Nothing against those, but there's a lot more in there. Just make a brief pitch um, for what the average Rhode Islander might enjoy seeing if they came to visit the RISD Museum. Well, thank you for that. We have you know, over 3,000 years of amazing objects. This museum is a gem, and it's a gem for the area. And it's a place for both contemplation, but also to learn. We have incredible interpretive materials. And you know, the objects in the RISD Museum are being requested for loans across the globe. The Louvre, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Prado, you know, every major museum is trying to get our objects into exhibits there. So it's a great opportunity for Rhode Islanders to come see them in person. And it's almost as if you're getting access to the best objects anywhere, and um, I, it's it's a very special place. It's a real jewel. Um, we had someone retire recently, who had been at the school for 50 years, and he was head of facilities, the kind of custodial and grounds crew. And I asked him, you know, what will you miss the most? And he said, um, I'll miss access to the RISD Museum with my family. And so we gave him a lifetime membership as a retirement gift. And um, you know, he, he just said it's, it's one of the most wonderful things to do with his grandchildren, to show them about worlds that they would never encounter any other way. That's a great story. President Summerson, thanks for sitting down with me, and congratulations on your retirement. Thank you so much, Ted.
Love that last story from President Summerson. When we come back, the staggering number of chronically absent school kids in Providence last year. Target 12 investigator Steph Machado joins us in studio. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, joined by 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi and Target 12 Investigator Steph Machado. Welcome back to the program, Thank Steph. You. Good to see you. Steph, we wanted, uh, we wanted you on to talk about the findings of your report into chronic absenteeism in the Providence Public Schools last year. And let's bring up some data to kick off this conversation. You found, and these, these numbers are wild, 60% uh, of Providence students had been chronically absent as, the end, as of the end of April. That's six out of 10 students, um, in, including both in-person and virtual learners combined. That's compared to 37% during the same period last school year. And even 37% to me yes. is <laughs> a staggering number, let alone 60% in the last year. First, I think it's important to set the table here and explain to folks what chronic absenteeism is. Yes, so you're considered chronically absent if you've missed 10% of the school days, which for a full year would be 18 school days. In this case, the most recently available data was as of the end of April, so 10% 10, 10 of the school days that had happened up until that point. You're considered chronically absent, which is obviously concerning um, for learning loss in school. So 18 days would be the, the, the minimum. I mean, the so minimum, you, yes. you could so have is, kids who is, lost yes. a lot more. 10% or more. There's certainly students who they call it excessively absent and mostly absent who have missed even more school. So look, chronic absenteeism in urban school districts, nothing new. Yes. That's been a, a, an issue for, for decades. But in your reporting, did you find that these results shocked even you know veteran teachers, veteran administrators? I mean, what was the reaction to to these yeah. numbers. I mean, look, even the 37% is is shocking, right? That this is already a problem in these urban school districts, but to have it go up to 60%, um, the school administrator I interviewed said she'd never seen numbers like this before. Oh. Um, and listen, there was a lot of reasons for this. The pandemic was a completely unusual year in the in everyone's world, but in the education world as well. Uh, there were students who had, you know, additional responsibilities. They had to take care of younger siblings who weren't in daycare or, or school anymore. They might've had to take care of grandparents. They might've had to pick up a job mm. to help their family during the economic downturn or pick up more shifts at their after school job. You know, grocery stores and whatnot employ a lot of teenagers and were very, very busy. Um, I spoke to someone who said they knew a student who became homeless during the pandemic and, and didn't have a home and therefore didn't have a place to sort of set up and do virtual learning. So there's, you know, there was a lot of factors here and uh, Providence had both in-person and virtual learning, but um, the absenteeism was high among both. And it's interesting stuff because there was such a push and it was unusual for a blue state um, by Governor Raimondo, the education commissioner, to get sc students back in school, at least part time last fall when it was very uncertain whether that would happen. And, and the big focus was on the urban school districts where they were particularly worried about learning loss. And they did that. But in this case, it looks like you know, at least you can't, you can't say that just reopening them in Rhode Island means that everything was okay. And I think that's part of it, Ted, because they reopened in person so early compared to other urban school districts, especially in New England, mm -hmm. there really wasn't a lot of pressure to go to school. There wasn't a lot of pressure on attendance. There wasn't enforcement of attendance. It was, you know, we hope you come to school, but we also understand that there are extenuating You found that they laid off the truancy officers. Correct. So there were a number of layoffs last summer, and there's been layoffs throughout the state turnaround of the schools in the central office. They want to have fewer people working at 797 Westminster and more people working in the schools. And part of that was the truancy officers. Um, they were not doing truancy court proceedings during the pandemic, which is when you send them to family court and say, you're a truant and you're, you know, we need to figure out how to get you back in school. Right. None of that was happening during the pandemic. They were calling families and knocking on doors and, and saying, you haven't been to school you know how can we help you get back in school but to not have that sort of accountability punitive right. yes um processes uh, certainly also contribute so it, is that going to be a thing of the past are they going to bring the truancy officers back do you know well i did get um an answer from the school district this week that they're planning to have one truancy officer compared to what this fall compared to uh, as far as i know they have had as many as seven oh wow in recent years um so they're gonna have at least one but they want to focus more on the engaging with students and getting them to come back to school because school is a place they want to be as opposed to somewhere they're forced to be. So yeah. I think it's 
it's yet to be seen if that works, right? When I was reading, uh, and I encourage people to also read the web story on this, because you have some additional information beyond what aired on television. And when I was reading it down before it, we published it, I was I just kept thinking about you know school. For some of us who are in our professional lives, this was a, a strange lost year. But a lot of stuff went on pause, and now we press play again. These students, this was first grade, this was sixth grade, this was ninth grade. I mean, unless they're going to be held back, uh, they've lost a huge amount of learning in a, in a troubled district already. I mean, I guess what did you hear from the people in the school district about about that about the long term yeah. effects of this lost year? Well, they're obviously being optimistic that they think they can accelerate learning. They're doing a special summer learning program that's different than what they've done in the past. They have 1,800 students signed up. They're planning that's to- That's voluntary though, that's right? That's voluntary, mm -hmm. yep. They're pl hoping that they'll be able to accelerate learning in the fall. They have a lot of ARPA funds from the Biden rescue plan that they could perhaps put towards some acceleration programs. But I also heard some pessimism, especially from teachers who were like, look, this student basically got no instruction from me this year I think they should be held back. This, the teacher in my story was a first grade teacher. I think she should be held back in first grade again. And it's unclear if that's going to happen. The district says retention decisions are going to happen at the end of the summer. That um, seems late. I mean, just as a parent wanting to know what's going to happen to my kid the next year. Yeah. I mean, aren't those decisions usually made at they the are. end of the school they are. year? And if a parent wants their child to be held back, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. In yeah. terms of kids who. Um, it's unclear. They've invited them to participate in the summer learning, and then they're going to make decisions at the end of the summer. But it, there does seem to be some hesitancy to hold kids back, considering what an unusual year it was. So let's take a look at another piece of data that you got, because Ted brought up the question about, you know, Providence went back to in-person learning uh, earlier than, well, I remember, the governor took a blowtorch to Pawtucket mm -hmm. um, mm. because they did not do that. You looked at virtual learners and absentee uh, rates there. What did, what did you find? Yeah, so Providence did have virtu a virtual option called the Virtual Learning Academy where you could sign up to do virtual five days a week and then there were some students who also did full-time virtual through their school and 48% of students who were learning full time from home uh, also were chronically absent. And it, attendance for virtual learning was pretty easy to be marked present. The teachers I spoke to said as long as you answered like a question at the beginning of the day, um, it showed that you were sort of logged on That's and, a here. and present. You're mm -hmm. here. Similar to, you know, you So can, that, there's no way that number is, is it's, lower it's, than it's that. It's higher than that. So once that you, is what some teachers have told me, yes, exactly. So teacher told me it was a girl that was, person that was marked present every day, but then didn't log on to the Zoom. So wasn't necessarily receiving that instruction, but they answered the question of the day. Maybe they did some of the assignments, mm -hmm. so they'd be marked present. And the district pointed out to me, they said, look, you can show up to school and be marked present, but not pay attention. So mm -hmm. that was sort of the equivalent, I think, of the attendance for virtual. I want to shift gears real quick question to you, Ted. Um, you've spent a considerable amount of time this week uh, reporting on the controversy that is swirling around Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, his family's uh, membership to the storied Bailey's Beach Club in Newport, where the membership there is predominantly white. Um, this really blew up, I mean, nationally. What do we know now that we didn't know a week ago when you started reporting on this? Right. So this has come up repeatedly over the years since Sheldon Winters has been a senator that, you know, he and his family belong to Bailey's and there have been allegations that it is all white. Some people have phrased it as whites only. Uh, you know, without a membership roster, I can't independently verify the number of, of people who are not white who are members of Bailey's. but. Both Bailey's and Senator Whitehouse have emphatically denied that it's all white. And I have talked to other people who are members who know Bailey's who've indicated, you know, there, there have been or even are now members of color. That said, I don't want to give the wrong impression. It is, as you said, Tim, predominantly white, heavily white. You know, this is an institution formed to be exclusive in the Gilded Age in the 1890s. Vanderbilt's, mm -hmm. Astor's belonged. You know, they weren't looking to have a very diverse, they were looking for kind of their sheltered world of wealth and privilege. And so, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse is not, his, he is not, it appears, the member. His wife, Sandra, is the member. Her family has its own longstanding roots in, in that sort of upper crust world of Newport. It certainly sounds like Sandra Whitehouse does not want to, to leave Bailey's, so they won't be leaving Bailey's. But Sheldon Whitehouse, I think what you're seeing here, along with him kind of just whiffing his, his comments about it initially, is 
you know, there's, I think we're in an era where there's not a lot of tolerance for perceived hypocrisy. And there's a feeling that Sheldon Whitehouse, who's so progressive on racial justice issues and in general, uh, but then when he's back in Newport, he acknowledged, even if he doesn't go to Bailey's as often as his wife, he goes to Ida Lewis Yacht Club, another mm -hmm. haven for the Newport elite that he acknowledged is not very different. You used the word whiffing. Uh, and in the Washington Post, I think, looked at it. Um, and they criticized him uh, mm -hmm. a bit for how he handled the initial response to all of this. That's what you mean by that, yeah, right? Yeah, I think there was a feeling that he kind of he kind of blew off the question. I'm sure he didn't like the question, but uh, at the same time, in the end, you know, as you saw from their reaction, you know, and we do see this with politicians periodically, something they think is a non-story or not a big deal, well, it just resonates with people, and then they wish they could take back the way they talked about it initially and treat it with a little more seriousness. I'm going to put you on the spot with 30 seconds left in the show. Uh, there's a search for a new superintendent in Providence. Uh, again, 30 seconds or less. Uh, where does that stand? And are we going to know who the finalists are? Yeah, so we have an interim superintendent, Javier Montañez. Uh, Commissioner Infante Green says she's going to post the super permanent superintendent job. Next week, she would not commit to our colleague, Tolly Taylor, to releasing the name of the finalists, mm. which is sure to be criticized. She did not release the names of the finalists for Harrison Peters' job either. However, she has not definitively said how the public will be able to participate in this process, so we will see. Steph Machado, Ted Nisi, thank you. Catch her report on WPRI.com. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.